I realize there is nothing I can say about luxury or travel that you don't know a thousand times better. Except maybe how it is from the other side of the table to a consumer who's been stumbling across the world for the better part of 40 years. And so I framed in my head a lecture. I've never given this before. I'm sure I'll never give it again. But just drawing from the journeys I've taken in the last year that I would say is about the hidden luxuries of the modern age and the premium of the real. By which I mean sort of flipping off this year's official theme that these days we are so surrounded by the virtual and the second hand and the unreal in a not good way that, as Paul was saying, I think we come to cherish the real and go out of our way to seek it as never before. But I was thinking as I was flying over here three days ago uh, that the last time I was on this continent was exactly a year ago to the day when I was lucky enough to visit Namibia. And as all of you know, Namibia has very quickly become one of the most stylish and fashionable destinations on the planet. And sure enough, almost as soon as I landed in Windhoek, I was transferred to a little 10-seater plane, and I sat in the cockpit next to the pilot, and we flew low over this extraordinary, weathered, seasoned, tough, rhino hide of a land, and we saw elephants grazing in water pools. And the minute we landed, um, I was whisked off to a thatched villa where the walk-in closet was larger than my whole apartment in Japan. And I was shown a bathtub with a shower in it, and then another beautiful shower in its own compartment, and then an outdoor shower. Uh, somebody was probably trying to hint something to me. Uh, and I was told that any time I wanted, I could get gourmet food uh, cooked by a French-trained chef. Uh, it wasn't surprising to me to learn that Brad and Angelina had been staying in the same place not long before. But I suspected that what drew Brad and Angelina to this place was not the high-end toiletries, not the three showers, not even the expert scouts who could take us to within about 20 feet of a cheetah or a wild dog or all kinds of amazing creatures, but the human factor. And, you know, all of you know that one of the beauties of going to a place like Namibia is even a city dweller like myself can learn to read the wind, can see how much history there is in a piece of elephant dung. Uh, all of us who go there learn about this wonderful conservancy system they have, whereby the government gives money to communities to preserve the wilderness that otherwise they would be tempted to destroy in the knowledge that if they preserve it, all of us will come into the country, pour more money into the economy, and allow the government to give more money to more conservancies. It's really a virtuous circle. Everybody stands to gain. The same people who learned how to read the land as poachers are now employed to be its caretakers. But for all of that, I've got to say the biggest luxury for me of going to Namibia was the gift of surprise. And my definition of a bad trip is one that goes exactly according to plan. My definition of a good trip is one in which you see things you never even thought to look for when you were back at home. You're drawn into things that you never would have imagined you were interested in. And I knew, of course, before I went to Namibia that I would be stirred by its natural beauty, but I never expected I would be so affected by its human uh, component. And the deeper luxury that I got while I was in Namibia was that when I left, I realized I had spent nine days and nine nights there, and I had never once set foot in an elevator. I had never once ridden an escalator. I'd never seen a traffic jam. <laughs> I hadn't seen any traffic. I barely had to go online. And in nine days and nine nights, I only made or received one phone call from the capital when I rang my wife back in Japan to remind her what time I was coming home. The whole thing was very human scaled, and of course, surrounded by such majesty and grandeur, I never missed the tiny screen. And I noticed that 30 years ago, when I began traveling full time, people's eyes would light up when I talked about going to Tibet or Cuba, because in those days, it was really quite difficult to get to, to places like that. Nowadays, 
people's eyes light up when I talk about going nowhere or going offline. Uh, just nine weeks ago, I went back to North Korea. And I hadn't been there since 1990. So 96 seasons had come and gone. The Clinton presidency, the George W. Bush presidency, Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, Y2K, Justin Bieber, a million things had come and gone. But probably you won't be surprised to learn that when I arrived in Pyongyang, I found my itinerary was identical to the one I'd been given back in 1990. But none of that mattered, because the people I was traveling with were so interesting. And of course, the kind of people who seek out North Korea as a holiday destination are an imaginative and adventurous group. And so the official part of my itinerary couldn't have been more boring, more predictable, more uninflected. But the human, unscripted, unofficial part couldn't have been more interesting. And of course, the previous time I'd been, I was traveling alone. And so really, for days on end, it was just myself talking with my guide. This time, I was with 14 other foreigners. So we had four or five North Korean minders or guides or spies with us most of the time. And our last night in Pyongyang, we had a rowdy uh, dinner on a river barge. Uh, our North Korean guide started leading us in very drunken renditions of Danny Boy and My Way. And many people in my party never even slept that night. And it was just a small reminder of how, I think in our daily lives, we really don't want to be deflected or diverted. We have people to see and things to do. But when we're traveling, I think what we most want to do is to be thrown off course and in some ways to meet those kind of digressions. And I've got to say, probably like many of your clients, I'm fortunate enough to live in two rather nice places, Nara, Japan, and Santa Barbara, California. So to be honest, I can get plenty of luxuries at home. If I'm really craving a gourmet meal or a massage or even a helicopter ride, I can get one down the street. What I can't get so easily are conversations with people whose circumstances are radically different from my own. And what I can get even less easily are conversations that last for five or 10 hours without any chance of interruption. And if those conversations are with a young woman who can tell me about growing up during the time of the Khmer Rouge, or a man who tells me about his mother who's a shaman, they are conversations that will stay with me for the rest of my life and change my life. And I think we all know that in some ways what we are seeking out as much as anything on our travels, is character. I think one of my favorite quotes about travel has always been from that great traveler, Henry David Thoreau, who said, it matters not how far you go, the further, commonly the worse. What matters is how alive you are. And I've always felt that that really refers to us, because destinations are much less important, as we all know, than the spirit we bring to them. You take a screaming kid to the Maldives, she'll be screaming even there. Uh, on the other hand, you take an open-hearted soul to Blackpool, and she may be transfigured. But the more I've traveled, the more I think that point about aliveness also applies to destinations. And I suppose my prejudice is that a few years from now, people may grow a little tired of places like St. Bart's, but I feel they will never get tired of Fez because there's an unquenchable vitality, something untamable. You never know what is around the next corner. There is a life there that nothing ever is going to get the better of. And we all know that the base camp of any trip is not falling ill, not being robbed, being well taken care of. But we also know that the peaks always come in the one-to-one, -one, or the face-to-face, -face, or the heart-to-heart. Clearly, everything I've said so far applies to the way travel has always been. If you had asked Odysseus or Gilgamesh about why they traveled, they would have said things akin to what I just said. But at the same time, all of us in a room like this know that travel has changed dramatically in our lifetimes. For every one international traveler in 1960, there are 40 today. Uh, in the city near which I live, Kyoto, Japan, there are 50 million travelers or tourists who come every year. 
So to put that into perspective, that's equivalent to the population of Greece and Sweden and Portugal and Ireland and Norway and Denmark and Finland thronging through those narrow lanes every 12 months. And of course, Mecca sees even more visitors and now is home to the highest Holiday Inn in the world, which is giving the Fairmont a run for its money. And as a result of all of this, I think we crave very different things than once we did. Um, I remember as a little boy, going to a luxury hotel, as often as not, meant going to a great European palace, rich with gilt and chandeliers and mirrors. And happily, it still does mean that quite often. But as often now, it means going to a sleek, white on white minimalist cathedral of emptiness where there's nothing but a lily on the transparent front desk. We used to prize heaviness. I think now we prize lightness. We used to prize going to a place that gave us a sense of occasion. Now some of us have to travel so much that often what we really want is to be liberated from a sense of occasion. We just want to be able to check in without fuss and then be admitted to a room that is probably more like a spa than a palace. Uh, some of you probably know the place called Tawaraya, the little 18-room inn in the center of Kyoto that's been in the same family for more than 350 years and is sometimes called the best hotel in the world. It was after staying in Tawaraya uh, more than once that Steve Jobs came up with, I think, one of the great principles of modern life, which is that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I think travel is really how we not just refine, but redefine our sense of what luxury is. Uh, I have a friend who's a billionaire, and he's often called the homeless billionaire because he literally has no fixed place of residence. He doesn't have a wife or kids. He gave away a lot of his money. But the one luxury he permits himself is a private jet. And the one promise he made to himself a few years ago was that every day he would meet some new interesting person. And so he literally just flies around the globe. And one day he'll meet the Dalai Lama, the next day Malala, the next day a Chinese neuroscientist, the next day a philosopher who can teach him about Plato. But I think he's rich enough to realize that the greatest luxury these days is a connection that's not a plane connection and not a phone connection, but a human connection. Uh, there's a new field in science known as interruption science. And researchers there have found that it takes the average human being 25 minutes to recover from an interruption, like a phone call or an email. But they've also discovered that for people in a room such as this, we get such distractions every 11 minutes. In other words, we're never caught up. We're always running behind. We're constantly out of breath. Not so long ago, I was talking to one of my uh, oldest friends in the world, whom I met my first week in college. And he's a very successful film producer now. And he told me that he'd just taken his daughter, who's my goddaughter, to the Seychelles, just the two of them. I said, gosh, that sounds amazing. What did you do? And he looked a bit embarrassed. And he said, well, actually, I read Proust, because I had to for my book group. And my daughter read Kafka, because that was what was on her university reading list. And he didn't need to tell me that he didn't have to go all the way to the Seychelles to read Proust and Kafka. But at some level, perhaps he did have to go all that way just to sit with his daughter doing nothing, just to be able to be quiet in a room uh, turning pages, just to feel that they had nowhere they had to be the following day. I think when we travel, we don't just need to be taken out of our homes. We need to be taken out of our habits and out of our habitual selves. To go back really to where I began, the more we can get on the iPhone, I feel, the more we crave everything that we can never get on an iPhone. Uh, you all know how we can nowadays see 500 U2 concerts online. And yet, people are more ready than ever before to spend $250 to go and see U2 live, even in the back seat of a huge stadium where they're really just following the action on a huge screen. If you want to learn about the history of Vietnam, you can probably do so better on the Discovery or National Geographic channel than by going there. If you want to see the perfume pagoda outside Hanoi, you can do so much more comfortably online. And yet, more and more people are using their time and money to go to Vietnam and Iran and 
Ethiopia and Haiti and all these places that are actually richly represented in our hometowns. And we all know that there can be um, an unsettling aspect to this when travel becomes a kind of consumerism, places become a kind of collectible. Um, this is the age of the selfie, so what we want is not the photo of the pyramids, but a picture of the pyramids with a Sharon on an angry camel in front of them, having probably lost her ATM earlier in the day. We want experience that is individualized and the kind that we could never get vicariously. And the one thing that travel gives us, which is so invaluable, is the chance to get lost. I think most of us in this room, uh, when we're at home, are surrounded by GPS devices. We have lots of on-demand gizmos. We wake up with the sense or with the illusion that we know pretty much how the day is going to go and we're in control of everything. Maybe I'll just end with uh, a couple of snapshots, really, of one of the great travelers of the 20th century, uh, whom I've been lucky enough to know since I was 17, as Paul mentioned, the Dalai Lama. And each of the last eight Novembers, he's come to Japan, and my wife and I have traveled in his very tiny entourage with him across the country for five or eight or 10 days. And quite often, I'm also with him in Los Angeles, and he'll usually be fated at some fundraising uh, lunch in Beverly Hills. And quite often, somebody will say to him, Your Holiness, how do you possibly live in India where you're surrounded by so much poverty all the time? And the Dalai Lama will look around the room where many, many people are on their fourth or fifth marriages, where quite a few are spending hundreds of dollars a day to see their therapists, where many of them, in fact, are seeking him out for guidance or counsel. And he'll say, well, there's poverty and there's poverty. And I think to invert that for our purposes, there's luxury and there's luxury. And in the course of his lifetime, the Dalai Lama has seen first Japan and then South Korea and then Taiwan and Thailand and now the People's Republic of China transform their economies to the point where they have more uh, Jaguars and Louis Vuitton bags than they know what to do with. And yet they're still thronging to him, lost and unfulfilled, asking for some direction. And every year when I travel with him, it's just a tiny reminder to me of what we all know, which is that luxury is not about accumulating new things. It's about taking notice of the things we already have. Luxury has nothing to do really with what you have in your hand or what you have in your house. It has only to do with what you have in your head and what you have in your heart. Luxury has almost nothing to do with how much you're able to acquire. It has everything to do with how much you're able to give away. So I really thank you for the luxury of your patience listening to me, and please have a wonderful conference. Thank you.